Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Damon Terrianis, president of the Trenton Historical Society. And as was just said, oh, we're here today to um, give this deed over to the uh, Trenton Library um, um, because it is a important piece of Trenton history in many ways. And I'm gonna, just for a couple of minutes here, try and explain why that is and how we came to uh, purchase the deed. So a few months ago, I, maybe a little longer than that now, maybe four or five, I started getting, and like one day in a couple of hours, I got a series of emails um, from a couple of board members with the Historical Society and from Sam Stevens um, that this deed had uh, was up for sale at a New York auction and that it what did have Mal and Stacy's signature on it. Um, to give a little preamble for that, about nine months, maybe a year before that, um, the Trenton Historical Society had organized a, a exhibition on various objects from Trenton's history that were rarely seen. And we went through the Trenton Library's collections fairly extensively at that point, uh, largely focusing to see if there were objects that we could borrow that were associated or had been signed by either William Trent or Mal and Stacy. And though at sort of the dawn of the library's history, well that's a little bit too far, but early, early 20th century, the library did, had had a couple of signed William Trent documents and a couple of things that were signed by Mal and Stacy. Over the intervening century, those things had disappeared from the collections. So that we found during that process, it, there was no longer, while clearly the state archives down the block here um, has quite a number of documents that are so signed and kept locked away in their safes basically by both individuals. Um, there really weren't any that were readily available for public display where someone could walk in off the street and take a look at one. So at that point, the Historical Society decided to go out, see if we could obtain one for that show, which we did at that time uh, through a New Jersey book dealer, um, Joseph Falcone. Um, we were able to purchase a signed Mal and Stacy deed, which we gave to the library as part of that exhibition. Um, that deed was missing its seal and was not, quite frankly, as interesting as the one that we're about to present today. So when we started getting those phone calls, and I, I got those emails about this being uh, available, um, the first thing was, well, that went through my head was, well, we just kind of just did this, and we just expended a bunch of money to make this purchase for this other deed. But then I really started to look at what this deed was and how much more significant it actually was than the previous one. And at about that time, Sam Stevens got in touch with me and asked me if we'd be interested as the Trent Historical Society on going half and half in the purchase of the deed with the Trent House organization, at least conceptually. Obviously, we had to run both those things by the respective boards, but was this something conceptually we'd be willing to do? And I, I said yes um, to that. Um, and then, probably a day later, I got a phone call from Joseph Falcone, who was the dealer who we bought the first deed from to make sure that I was aware of this one. And he very kindly offered to represent us for free in the purchase of the deed at the auction, since he's a book dealer and was going to be attending the auction anyway. Um, so we were able uh, um, to purchase the deed um, at actually the absolute maximum bid that we had intended to pay. Um, Joe had also been contacted by the state of New Jersey about possibly purchasing the deed, but they were willing to pay slightly less than we were. So the state <laughs> bowed out at that point and just said, you guys go ahead and do it. Um, part of the reason the state was interested in, is, in it is because most deeds are recorded uh, when they become official. This is a deed that was never actually recorded. And that's not a rare thing. There's a lot of deeds aren't there that aren't recorded. But although this deed is referenced in other later deeds, there's no actual nothing, there's no documentation that the state has as to what this deed says it specifically, and there's no copy of it actually on file at the state. Um, part of the reason for that, I believe, is because this is a very, very early deed. And that gets us back to the reason why it's so important. Um, this deed is from Mal and Stacy to his brother, selling the rights to take up lands in the colony, actually province of West Jersey, um, to his brother Robert Stacy. 
Um, Mal and Stacy, who um, Sam mentioned earlier, um, had come into uh, the right to a large percentage of the colony. And this came um, through a kind of an indirect way. He had lent along with five other Yorkshire Quakers, um, so we're back in England now, um, a fairly substantial sum of money, um, somewhere around 2,000 pounds to another Quaker um, named Edward Billinge. And Billinge had gotten himself into financial trouble, which was really discouraged by Quakers at the time. Um, both taking on debt was discouraged, but then getting in that far over your head was really discouraged. And it was something of a scandal. Um, and in order to sort of correct that, uh, the Society of Friends appointed a number of trustees who were to manage his estate and to help him get out of, out of debt. Um, just before this had happened, Billinge, I believe it was before, Billinge had um, come into a unique opportunity to purchase from, um, is it, I'm trying to remember Berkeley's first name, who, who escapes me right now, but it was Berkeley and George Carteret, who were two noblemen who had purchased um, the rights to New Jersey, the colony of New Jersey, from the Duke of York, the king's brother. Um, the eastern half of New Jersey was sold to a bunch of proprietors and investors, largely from Scotland. The western half went, was sold to Ed Edward Billage. So when Billage became financially imperiled and these trustees were appointed, this was the obvious selling off this piece of land and these rights were the things which were seen as the best way to get him out of debt. Um, so I think there, there were four or five trustees. The only name any one of you would know in this room of those trustees was William Penn. Um, because he was the most prominent English Quaker at the time, and he, he was given the lion's share of the responsibility for figuring out how to create sort of a Quaker settlement in New Jersey, which is what the goal of this was, was to find a place for Quakers to come away from sort of disrupt the disrupting influences in England, where they could raise their families in a Quaker community um, away from urban influences, away from other things which had pretty rapidly started to uh, take away Quaker sons and daughters from the faith, if you can call it faith necessarily. They were returning to sort of common uh, Church of England culture uh, when they moved from the country to the cities because they didn't really have a way to support themselves and establish themselves. This was the collective answer. And William Penn saw it, although I'm not sure where he where it really was in the planning for Pennsylvania at the time, but the colony of West Jersey was really the trial run for all of that. How to set up a colony which would function in a similar way, which would both bring a large financial benefit to the guy who was selling the properties, but also establish the kind of community and the kind of colony that he was looking to create. Um, so, Mal and Stacy um, and uh, four or five other uh, prominent younger sons of noblemen and very well financially established men from the Yorkshire region in England um, purchased from uh, these trustees headed by William Penn along with some other individuals. Let me get this right. All in all, they purchased 10% of 90 shares of the colony of West Jersey. And the reason that was done was because there were 100 shares. 10, 10 of those shares were immediately, very quickly sold to a man named John Fenwick, who very quickly after that planted his own small colony um, down in South Jersey uh, around the towns of Greenwich and Salem established down there. This was done um, against the wishes of Penn and the other trustees because they were planning for a single unified settlement. But Fenwick bought his shares and very quickly got on a boat and got down here and started creating his own little fiefdom down in South Jersey. Um, so as I said, he sold 10% of the remaining 90 shares. They sold 10% of the remaining 90 shares to 
Malin, Stacy, and Stacy, and these other four or five individuals in order to uh, erase the debts that Edward Billinge owed to them. Um, and this is a fairly, I mean, 10% of 90 shares is a fairly large um, piece of real estate when it comes to what they were actually entitled to. Um, the deed that you see today here in front of you is for 0.6% of one of those shares, basically. Okay, One of those 10 shares. And that comes down to, that works out to something like that deed was worth 16,000 acres. So it may not seem, I mean, you're seeing the breakdown go on here. There's something like 6 million acres in New Jersey, 3 million more or less in, in West Jersey. And Mal and Stacy and his friends were entitled to something like, you know, 9%, 8 or 9% of those 3 million acres uh, through what they had bought um, for about, as I said, 2,500 pounds is what they paid. This deed, which Mal and Stacy sold to his brother, uh, the lands, the, the, the point sixth of a, of a share, of a 90th, um, he sold to his brother for 25 pounds, to give you an idea of what the price for that, that land sale was at that point. Now, the thing to remember, one of the things that makes this deed really remarkable, is that when this deed was written, none of these Quakers, except for John Fenwick, had come to the New World yet. So this deed was written in England, probably in London. Uh, it says January of 1677, which is probably right. There's some issues with the date, but that's, that's probably the correct date on it, uh, 1677. Two months after signing that deed, after Mal and Stacy signed that deed to his brother Robert, who was actually his older brother, um, Robert got on a boat, uh, which was the Kent, uh, with a between one and 200 Quaker settlers and came over here and reached here in the fall and landed at Burlington. Robert was appointed one of the commissioners um, of the proprietors for, founding, uh, for the founding of New Jersey. And this deed, to a large extent, gave him part of the rights to take up that post. He was one of the guys who came over here and who was charged with figuring out how this new colony was going to work, um, figuring out who was going to take up their land and where it was going to be. And one of the most important things he did was he was one of the guys, one of a very, only a couple of, of individuals, who was directly responsible for negotiating with the Native American inhabitants of the area to purchase the land rights to the lands that they had acquired through, well, all the way back up to King Charles. Um, but he was the guy who had to, to meet with these guys and, and negotiate that purchase. Now, while he did this, his brother Mal and Stacy remained in England. Mal and Stacy wouldn't get to the New World for another year. So Robert was the guy who determined that the Yorkshire Quaker share was going to be taken up on lands that were more or less between the Assin Peak and Rancocas Creeks. He was the guy who figured out that this was probably going to be where Malin was going to take up his lands up here at the falls. He made that choice. It was recognizable to him fairly early on that this was a key and important property, being right here at the only place, well, the southernmost place that the river was fordable. Um, he, of course, since Burlington was the provincial capital and, and the most desirable piece of real estate, had his own lands largely laid out next to Burlington, New Jersey, which is where he himself lived. Um, but he was here to host Malin when Malin first came over and to help Malin Stacy make his way up here and take up the particular piece of land um, which you're seated and standing at today. Um, so he really was very, very key um, to figuring out why Trenton is where it is and is what it is. He was the guy on the ground when there was no one else here really making those decisions. Um, in combination with a couple of other key individuals here as well. Um, so this deed being from Malin to Robert, giving Robert those land rights which allowed him to exert that authority when he got over here is an extremely 
important document. It's also important um, because although there may be a couple of other deeds out there that are like this, I personally off the top of my head don't know of any. This may be one of, if not the only artifact that originally came over on one of those Quaker ships that survives today. Because Robert Wood had, this was signed probably probably in London, and, and Robert Wood had brought this with him as key evidence of that property. There's a small chance, since most two copies were made of each deed, there's a small chance this is the deed that would have remained in England. Um, but most likely, it's the one that came over um, with Robert. Now, Robert, as I said, um, ran a tannery and a large farm and had a townhouse in Burlington. He stayed there until the 1690s. Um, when, it's at an unknown date, he moved over to Philadelphia, where he died in 1701. And that might, may be why this deed has largely stayed out of circulation, didn't end up uh, with the majority of the West Jersey proprietor's records, which are over at the archives, because it might have been over in Philadelphia, not, and it wasn't quite obviously as interesting being in Pennsylvania rather than New Jersey until it, it reached the market today. Um, but that's, that largely sort of sums up the story on it. Um, sure. Yeah, you're saying that deed goes from the Acid Pink to Ron Cocos Creek? No. More or less? No. Though that Mal and Stacy and those five original Yorkshire uh, Quakers who purchased the land owned 10% to 90 shares in New Jersey, which they were allowed to take up those deeds in this area in the area between the Rancocas and the Assin Bank. So they could lay out their lands here and have them formally assigned to them in this area. So what portion of what is now present day New Jersey in this area did that deed cover? And we know it covers along the river, but how far east did it go okay. also? This particular deed doesn't specifically relate to any particular well, it, it's complicated. This gave him the right, it was issued in England before any of these got here, to take up X number of acres of land. When he actually got here, he did one of two things. He either had lands laid out to him in certain areas by the West Jersey proprietors, with you know smaller parcels of land between those two uh, creeks, or he then turned around and sold the rights to others to have land so laid out to themselves. You were prohibited from owning too much land in one big tract, that was one thing, so there were limits on the size of how much property you could take up. There were limits of how much river frontage or water frontage you could take up, because they didn't want one or two influential people taking all of the best lands. Um, so that's why it was done that way. Um, it's a little murky. There are some other lands, he probably used those land, this particular deed, take up some of the land that he owned around Burlington. Um, I believe I saw another deed out there that referenced this deed and the rights that he got from this deed uh, for someone else to take up lands, I think, in Columbus. Um, but it would take a lot of work to figure out where all of those 16,000 acres were really ultimately So basically, out. this deed is a deed for property, but it's a deed for property that we can't determine the exact boundaries of today. You could, but it would take a lot, a lot of work working backwards. It could be done, but it would take a lot of work. And, and my guess is, I mean, it all became very murky and difficult about where all that land ended up getting laid out because the boundaries of East Jersey and West Jersey shifted a couple of times based on law courts. And you will find Mal and Stacy and some of the other Trenton area settlers ending up getting lands laid out to them in like more, uh, Warren County, all the way up there in the very northern corner of, of West Jersey, because they still had rights to lands under their original deeds. But everything, by the point those lands got laid out, everything south of Hunterdon County had been claimed and grabbed, and they were just picking up the last little bits. And you will also see up on counties along the borderline, 
you will see some West Jersey deeds to properties that are now in East Jersey because that boundary shifted or that were later in East Jersey because that boundary shifted and there wasn't a full understanding on the ground of exactly where it was when those borderline properties were laid out. Yes? And how, how, how were the lands assigned? Like, was there a person or a group of individuals who needed to determine? Yes. You, there was a surveyor for the West Jersey, official post surveyor for the West Jersey proprietors. You would, the way the process worked would be, you would take this deed, which entitled you to X number of acres, generally 1% of a share. You'd say, I'd like some land in this general location and you'd go to the surveyor and you'd say, lay me out 200 acres somewhere in X township, preferably along the Assenkunt Creek. And he would go out there and, and find a part that hadn't been taken up and assign it to you. You could ask for a specific property in some cases, and if everything worked out, you would get that property. Obviously, people like Mal and Stacy, who got here first, could go and say, I want the land right here. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Hutton Moore. Sure, go ahead. What was the, max, the maximum amount of land that Trent owned at uh, any given time, the maximum amount he owned in acres? I think Sam has said, and I can't remember this off the top of my head, that in this sort of general parcel, it was about a thousand. But William Trent very likely owned little bits of land scattered elsewhere as well, too, because he was a man of prominence in business. And guys like that picked up tracks, and they weren't just always part of their home track. Is, is that your understanding, Sam? Yes, as I understand that he bought the 800 acres from the son of right. Stacy, Stacey, and then acquired south of here along the river an additional 200 acres that helped him have access. You're shaking your head. No, no. Right. Those 200 acre lots were parallel side by side, long, narrow lots that had a small amount of river frontage, but extended all the way back up kind of to where 129 is today, sort of long, narrow strips of land that went all the way up like that. And how much of present day Trenton would Trent have owned? Do you have any idea where the boundary would have been in present day Trenton? We do know where the boundary is. Um, I don't have a map to show you where that is. Sam, are you going to say something? Um, something to look forward to is uh, <laughs> Richard Hunter's group has um, done a, a, an overlay of what, as best they can tell from the deeds, that original 800 acres onto a current map of uh, Trenton. And um, we are, he has produced a video for us that actually illustrates how this property's neighborhoods have changed over the centuries and I mean, to, to give you, I mean, roughly, it doesn't go quite as far as the State House, but it goes maybe half that way up the distance. It goes way back that way to the east, uh, way past the Broad Street Bridge, way further east than that. The Broad Street Bridge, Mal and Stacy had had a grist mill. Uh, William Trent got that same mill when he purchased the property, rebuilt it into most, really the largest mill in New Jersey at the time. Um, but it, there was a big long tail of it that went even considerably further east than that. And then it went down, as Sam just said, uh, sort of south of here, sort of in the area of Ferry Street, but a little bit beyond, I believe, if I remember correctly. I'm just, it's been a long time since I've looked at it, but that's sort of where the majority of the tract was. Right? Yeah, sure. One, one last question. Mm -hmm. Did the auction house, or do auction houses share like how they came upon this really interesting artifact? Like how, how did they come well, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of collections this could have come out of. And this was one of the larger auction houses. I mean, it wasn't a Christie's or a Sotheby's, but it was a big one. 
Um, so they would have agents overseas as well too, so it really is a little murky. They are not supposed to tell you um, where their items come from in many cases. They can. They can state the provenance, but generally uh, for a lot of things, consigners don't want that information given out for one reason or another. They also don't want you tracking down where it came from, what, what they paid for it, that kind of information. Um, however, I s suspect within a year or so, we will know where it came from. After, after a lot of those issues sort of resolve themselves and people don't feel that there's, there's problems with giving out that information, it, it, it will come to us. But as of right now, we don't know. Don't you know the provenance of the deed before you buy it? No. No, we don't know who the person who's consigning it to the auction house is. But even going back, I mean, you don't know. Don't know. No, there is a, and I can't remember what the name of it, there's a little note on the back of this deed which says, given to someone, it's a very generic name, in like 1892. And I did a hour or two look search to try and figure if I could find that person in either Trenton or Philadelphia. And of course, in Philadelphia, there's a hundred people with that name and initial, and I didn't see anything quickly in the resources I was able to quickly look at in Trenton. Um, but no, I mean, presumably this went to Philadelphia with him before he died. And in 1701, his estate was settled by his son. And it went along with the son's papers in 1701, and where that, you know, what the path was from there to this auction house, we don't know. Okay, so the middle, you don't know, but I'm just, I thought the provenance would authenticate the, yeah, the validity of the. Well, I mean, yes, it would be nice to have that provenance. There's no doubt by any expert that this deed is what it is based on the handwriting, the materials it's on, the condition it's in, everything is right for this deed. And it's not of the kind of value that it would be worthwhile for someone to make the effort to fake something like this. Um, nor necessarily because, quite frankly, while we paid a lot of, a fairly decent amount of money for it, there's probably a market of about 10 potential buyers in the United States who are willing to spend that kind of money on a deed like this because it's got a narrow market because it's got to be someone who's interested in 17th century New Jersey stuff and particularly <laughs> Trenton stuff. You know, that's not a lot of people out there. Um, now, now, the fact that... Um, the fact that this deed is kind of was never recorded suggests that all of that 16,000 acres or so that he was entitled to probably had been given off or sold away by the time he died. So the deed was probably at that point irrelevant and was just with a bunch of other family papers for a couple of generations before it was dispersed. Yeah. What are they doing to protect that to keep it from fading and stuff? Is it going to be kept in the open so people can see it, or what are they going to do with it? It's going to be on display in a protected location here for a short period of time, and then it will be held safely at the library um, where it will be kept in archival conditions. And yes, you will be able to go and request it and take a look at it, but it will only be out for a short period of time. The primary threats to a document like this are going to be moisture and are going to be light. Um, and light is the most significant one of this, or most significant um, threat. As long as this thing is kept from a moisture standpoint in fairly normal situations, it should be fine. Um, it's on vellum, not paper, so the whole acidity problem is not there. The biggest problem I think you're likely to have for moisture is mold, but you're only going to get that in an extreme moist situation. The light is a much more significant issue, um, but as long as that's moderated and it's kept in dark storage most of the time, it'll be fine. What are the plans for editing and publishing the document? At the moment, there are no plans. It should be. Um, if nothing else, I mean, the state has sort of asked us if we would give them a copy of it at some point so they could have a record of it. Um, but as of right now, we just haven't gotten that far yet. Okay.